Welcome everyone. My name is Rami Deeb and I am the uh, Communications and Community Coordinator at MIT Enterprise Forum and today I am super delighted to be kicking off the first episode of our boardroom webinar series with a very exciting topic. Uh, I have with me Pakiza Abdurrahman, Head of Startups from Bahrain Economic Development Board and Dr. Ayman Ismail, who is the international expert on entrepreneurship and economic development. And he's the uh, chair at Abdul Latif Jamil, uh, endowed chair at American University of Cairo and founder of AUC Venture Lab. Uh, today's topic is super, super, super exciting for me personally. It's called the ethics and entrepreneurship uh, facing the crisis with principles. Uh, it's, we have a very uh, exciting uh, discussion today planned as promised. Uh, and I, I, I made this brief introduction huge questions, huge debate that's going to uh, take over. And I leave the floor to uh, my good friend, Ms. Pakiza Abdurrahman. Hi, Pakiza. Hi. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, Rami, uh, for the introduction. Thank you, MIT, for hosting uh, such um, interesting sessions uh, that I uh, am also thankful for uh, joining them, um, hosting uh, today's session with Dr. Ayman and Thank you to everyone who tuned in to, uh, to attend it. Um, we promise to keep it engaging, to, keep, uh, to unlock some of uh, uh, the deep uh, uh, topics um, overlooking ethics and entrepreneurship, doing the right thing versus doing what's right for the organization, what ethics is all about, and, and different areas that we'd love to explore um, and hear more about it from uh, Dr. Ayman. Um, stay with us till the end of the hour. We will open it up for uh, questions and answers from the audience. Um, and uh, let's, let's get started. Um, my, first my first question um, uh, to Dr. Ayman is about the, the definition of ethics. So I heard, I read uh, uh, um, somewhere uh, a great quote uh, from Peter Stewart, uh, where he mentioned, where he says he defines ethics as knowing the difference between what you have a right to do and what is right to do. And I, and I stood at it thinking about it and thinking about the different um, um, elements that underlies this definition. So, so Dr. Ayman, how do you define ethics? What is ethics? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Pakiza, and uh, thank you, Rami, and uh, the whole enterprise, MIT Enterprise Forum, for uh, this wonderful uh, series, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, the topic, honestly, is very challenging because um, I've been working in the space of entrepreneurship and business for quite some time, and whatever we're talking about, we're talking about uh, building startups, investments, uh, uh, getting talent, new innovations, and not every, we're, ethics is not part of our narrative. It's not part of our discourse. It's not part of the conversation that we're having. Uh, and I think implicitly everybody um, takes it that it's a personal decision uh, that everybody should be ethical. They take it for granted, but it's actually not something that should be taken for granted. And it's something that we need to have explicit conversations about. <clears throat> so let's, let's start from the beginning. What is ethics? For me, it, it's just simply, a moral compass. Uh, so, uh, your value system as a person or startup or organization that tells you what's right and what's wrong. So what does that mean? Uh, first thing is that it is demonstrated when there is a decision point. So ethics is not something that's absolute. We talk about uh, uh, values like fairness or caring about the environment or uh, equality and egalitarian or uh, meritocracy or whatever you want to call it that are uh, part of the value system that we live at. And all of these things are theoretical conversations. Uh, sometimes they're words that people put on their wall. Uh, you walk into an organization, you find a code of ethics or a set of values or vision and all of that, but they're really worth nothing until they come into practice. And when does the practice happen? Yeah. It happens at decision points. Uh, and when the decisions are easy, then it's very easy to do the right things. Uh, when the decisions are hard, this is where the choices become hard and doing the right thing become hard. Even for people who are decent, honest, well-intended and ethical in nature, it is just tough choices. And I think the environment that we're going through right now uh, makes those choices, make those tough choices uh, more common and make many of us, many of us, whether as entrepreneurs or 
just normal people were facing those challenges. Uh, now, let's put ethics in the context of a startup. Uh, it's very easy to talk about individual value systems or ethics as an individual. And there's a lot of people who talk about this. Now we're putting it in the context of business. But um, when we're talking about a big company, then we have a certain, usually big companies, corporations, they have certain codes of ethics and things are entrenched. But let's take the startup. Startup, take it through the life cycle of a startup. What do we start with? We start with a small team of founders or an entrepreneur, individual solo entrepreneur. And then we start to proceed with a small company, uh, maybe a dozen people, 20, 30 people. And then we start to become a large, well-established company. So those are three distinct phases. Uh, phase one, uh, me, one person, or two, three people as entrepreneurs. We are the company. So our personal decisions are the company decisions, the startup decisions. So we need to be very careful because we shape the code of ethics of the company. The company is built around our personal code of ethics and values. And at the beginning, usually everybody's worried about execution and money and customers and products. It becomes an expli implicit, converse, uh, ex implicit actions. They're not explicit. People don't discuss them openly because they're running around. Uh, so that's the big challenge. You start moving into a small company. Then we're getting other people inside. Then we start thinking, should those people behave based on your their personal moral compass, code yeah. of ethics, or should we, they comply into something that we collectively decide? Or honestly, that we as founders want to decide because we care about what the company looks like. So we get into the point of we have to codify those things so that those new incoming people find a moral compass that is not just dependent on their own individual uh, code of ethic, but it's common among ourselves because not everybody shares the same code of ethics. It doesn't say that everybody is bad, but they just come from different backgrounds, value systems, priorities and lives, and so on. Then you start becoming a big company then you have to actually make it more codified because the number of people is bigger. They're not 20 people who can fit in one room. So I tell them what I think the code of ethic, we discuss it and we agree on it and we abide by it. No, it, there are some people based in other countries. I have some employees in Germany or in Vietnam or in Kenya and in Dubai and in Cairo and whatever. They're just different people, different cultures. And I want to make sure there's something common among ourselves. So those are different stories. At the beginning, it's individual. Then you might start codifying it. And then it starts trickling down into policies, procedures, and culture, which is the unwritten norms. And all of these things are the things that we need to talk about. So that, that's basically what I think about. So what's your moral compass? How can you entrench it in the company? And then what are the challenges you're facing personally as entrepreneurs or as a small upcoming organization? in making decisions that are in sync with what you think is right. Because consistency is king, right? So um, um, maybe I want to talk more about, um, yeah, let's get into the definition a bit deeper. Um, you mentioned something in the beginning about you noticed around you in this region that ethics is a given or it's taken for granted. Mm -hmm. Why is that in your opinion? And, and is it something that is relevant to the MENA region versus other geographical uh, uh, locations? Is there something that, that, that is allowing us to take things for granted and not maybe being explicit about our ethics or what we stand for? Um, honestly, I, I don't know if I can compare to other parts of the world. I think there's some things that are common in general. Mm -hmm. uh, but there might be some things that are common to us that are more actually specific to us in the region. Uh, I think we're probably more of a verbal culture. We like to have more conversations. We're less about codifying things. You'll find that more of our conversations, more of our communications inside companies or as people or in business, they're more on the verbal side. They're less on the uh, codified written side. Uh, and some cultures like short contracts, others like long contracts, and some of them agree with the handshake. Mm -hmm. So these are, these are parts of the culture that we have. If you go to the US, you'll find that the Americans like detailed contracts, 500 page with every single thing spelled out. You go to China, it's a one page contract. Mm -hmm. 
but there is a certain mutual expectations. I think uh, cultures that have deeper norms and expectations, uh, usually those are more stronger, uh, they're codified in the culture in a stronger way, the expectations are stronger. Uh, so people shy away from having to write them. Uh, but I think it's important to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not about writing things. It's about the conversation that leads to writing things. Yeah. If I give you a, a sheet of paper that says, here are the five values of this company. Here is the code of ethics of this company. What do you do with it? Like, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Some companies make people sign a code of ethics. Yeah. Um, people sometimes don't read it, or even if they read it, they say, okay, it's blah, blah, blah. The question is, how do you live by that code of ethic? What are the implications of the things you write on paper on your day-to-day decision-making? Especially when things are tough and stakes are high. That's when it counts. And that's when you can say those people are adhering to what they claim or it's just lip service and words you put on the wall. Um, ethics as an individual versus ethics as a company. Um, and, and you mentioned clearly um, how different stages have different um, 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 sort of application uh, to, to the values of the, their organization. Ethics also um, affect the choices you make, right? Uh, you mentioned the no, everything becomes theoretically amazing once it's written somewhere or communicated somewhere, um, but it's tested what the yeah. what the entrepreneur faces a, a life threatening situation or a business uh, threatening uh, um, situation where they have to take a decision on hiring or um, um, firing um, on using a specific supplier or um, uh, growing into a specific market or even accepting investment from a specific um, investor. So these kind of chain uh, choices, what is the best framework that entrepreneurs can apply to, um, um, in your opinion, that they can sort of apply to, or what are the things they should consider when facing a situation like this? So let's, I think the, the discussion theoretical until you start actually putting thing, real examples. So let's take some examples from the points that you list. And this is an excellent list of day-to-day -day choices that everybody faces. So let's take um, simple decision as things related to the environment. Mm -hmm. So I personally care about the environment, okay? Uh, what does my caring about the environment translate into? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to buy a product. The product is wrapped in plastic. So I want to actually request that we use less of the uh, single-use plastics or plastics in general. Plastics are very useful material, however, too much of it thrown away is very destructive to the environment. Yeah. When I do that, maybe I need to buy uh, a bag that is made out of cloth that is a little bit more expensive that I can use for my shopping rather than the bags. That's an individual decision. That's a very simple individual decision. It has a positive outcome, but it has a price to pay. Part of the price is about paying for that bag. Part of the price is about actually changing my behavior that every time I go buying things or shopping, I take this thing with you, with me and I walk it, walk inside and do that. So what do I need to do? Making the, being conscious of the problem, making a decision that this is a value or a code of ethic I want to adhere to, preparing myself to do for that, which is a change and paying the cost for it. Okay. When it's an individual, that's my individual choice. So I make the decision, I, if I do it, I make the change and I pay the cost. Now let's pick a company. So you are a company and how do you make a decision like this? That decision has to involve someone making the decision. So first, who is the decision making? And second, organizational change that you're changing the behavior of whoever number of employees that you have, but also changes in the policies and procedures because you might have to codify that in your procurement rules or in some manuals that are out there. And then third is changing the culture, making sure people know about that and they're using it or they're doing it. So that's a big challenge. So if I come and I say, um, uh, look at companies that are producing products with packaging. I work in an FMCG company. Okay, and we have great FMCG companies, but they produce a lot of packaging that is 
single-use plastics. And I don't like that. And I work, someone who work in some part of that company, how can I affect that change? I don't have the capacity to do that. So the company needs to come and say, uh, we need to have a policy that says we are going to try and reduce our packaging. Okay, so who's the company? Companies about a lot of people and management and individuals. So we have to figure out if it's a small company, then it's a small group of management. If it's a big company, that's a big decision. So we have to do something about that. And then, so how do we push that through the organization? And then what are the financial implications? What are the costs of doing that? And who's paying for it? Is that cost prohibitive or not? So that's the trade-off that people come to. And part of it is financial trade-off. Part of it is institutional, organizational trade-off. And part of it, maybe every single person in the company want to do that. But how do I actually make it happen, create momentum? We're all uh, busy doing whatever we're doing. But now I have to convince the whole company that it is a priority. So that's when you get the role of leadership trying to put that through the organization. So that, that's the challenge that's out there. Um, and we can talk about a ton of other challenges, but that, that's what tells you the difference between an individual decision, I can affect change, and an institutional decision. Startup is somewhere in the middle because yeah. part of the decision is individual. We're five founders, three founders. We get on the table and we say, you know what? I don't want to use single, uh, single use plastics or I want to improve my environmental footprint. How can we do that? Here are five ideas. Are we ready to do them? Yes. Can we afford them? Yes. Let's go and do them. Yeah. So we affect change. Okay. So that, that's what you have. So first you have to figure out what is the value you want to have? And then what are the implications on your daily behavior? And then how do I make the change happen? And what is the cost of that change? And what is the organizational change process policies that needs to Do you consider happen? profit gains our, our opportunities to monetize uh, the, 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 the announcement of your ethics and, and the values you stand for as an organization? So, so let's step back a little bit. Um, why do people have those codes of ethics or discuss this? So there are two sides of the stories. Um, one is I want to be a good person who has who lives by a certain moral compass. Yes. So I care about the environment, mm -hmm. for example, or I care about diversity, or I care about equality, or I care about, those are a set of values that I care about. So I am pushing that because of a personal gain. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a lot of the parts, a lot of the conversations around codes of ethics, values are driven by the personal values of the founders of the company or the leaders of the company. And companies mimic people. Companies are artificial constructs, but they mimic people. They don't have values of their own. They reflect the values of their leaders yeah. and their, their, their teams, their employees. That's, that's where the values of a company come. A company is not a creature. We are the creature. We are the collectively the company. So, so now I have to uh, uh, figure out what are my personal values as a person. But now let's get into the organization, uh, that, that's the first reason. I want, first reason why I want it. I want to actually follow my personal code of ethic. But there's another reason, which is sometimes it's a utilitarian reason. It's for my benefit to act with a certain code of ethics. Uh, and there are several examples of it. One is I want to uh, benefit from it, or I want to avoid bad things that could happen. So for example, at some point in time, uh, many companies in the textiles apparel sector uh, were pushing the manufacturing of their apparel, shirts, gowns, whatever, to be done in uh, countries with cheap labor. Mm -hmm. That reduced the cost substantially. And then some activists started saying, look at the conditions where the workers who are making your shirt uh, operate under. Is that fair? And then through that campaign, they started convincing consumers that, you know what, it does not make sense for me to wear a shirt that is worth X dollars uh, let's say shirt is $50 and it's made and the workers get five cents out of that. And they're in miserable conditions and their child labor and their environmental abuses and, and, and it doesn't make sense. So consumers started pushing back. So companies started saying, you know what, it is in our interest uh, to actually do things in better ways. So they started getting into labor standards, environmental standards as part of their manufacturing outsourcing agreements. So rather than the shirt being produced for a dollar, now it's produced for a dollar and a half, but 
slightly better. You still make a ton of money, but you've at least improved a little bit. This came from consumer activism yeah. to make the companies uh, not just be aware, but care. Yeah. Okay. So and they're willing to actually pay an extra buck for for standing by those ethics and those values that exactly. those as, as clients are are so uh, uh, they feel strongly about. Exactly. So they started. You started that, but uh, 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 sometimes you want to make sure that for the company there mm-hmm. is a financial incentive, not just uh, the I want to feel good or I want to yeah. do things because sometimes the financial pressures on companies trump those things. Sometimes you can do the other way is now you can say, my product is done in a fair way, fair trade, or it's green, or it's bio, or it is environmentally friendly, or it is using less packaging, or it is using all of these things. So sometimes you might start and say, you know what, I am operating in a better way and that is part of my differentiation in the market. So mm-hmm. my product is equivalent to Pakiza's product, but my product is more environmentally friendly. Yeah. Are you willing to pay premium for that as a consumer? Mm. Okay. So now you're putting it in a different way, but that comes uh, to be part of your product strategy and your co- targeting. And I mean, Pakiza, yesterday we were discussing the millennials. We have in millennials as a new generation, they care more about doing good, doing the right yeah. things, feeling good about it. So they have a preference for products with values attached to it, yeah. values that they care about, values like uh, caring about the environment, caring about people, caring about labor, caring about supply chains, yeah. uh, doing b- ethical business, fair business, fair trade. So when you start putting that as part of your product message, then it becomes a good a way to monetize yeah. that. It becomes a promise as well, right? And it becomes um, um, a claim that um, you then can get into um, um, commercializing it, but also putting a value to it, and um, which opens to us another topic. Yeah, but, but before you when go to you the topic, mer- just just before you go to that topic, yeah. <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna say that there's a big line between having a code of ethic, ethics yeah. and having a product strategy. Okay. Okay, so a product strategy is because I see a market opportunity in a new segment that cares about that. Yeah. I, and it's great to have a product that is consistent with your personal values or the values of the customer that you're doing. But it remains a product strategy that is done for a financial gain which is different from having a personal code of ethic that I'm willing to live by regardless of the financial gain and before the financial gain. It drives what business do I get into. So maybe I choose to get into this line of products because it's consistent with my code of ethic or personal values. And I choose to get out of other lines of products because I don't like the values that they actually that I need to exhibit to operate in that space. So that, that, that those are two separate places. Okay. It might overlap somewhere, but they're distinct things. Back to you. And it, and it also differs based on sector, right? So, so there are some sectors that are very um, um, stringent and, and um, your, your individual sort of values need to um, coincide and mimic your product uh, values and, and promises. Sometimes the level of tolerance uh, per sector differs as well. Um, um, if you say, for example, uh, you are producing um, 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 hormone-free chicken, um, and then you face an, an incident with one of your batches um, having to go through that um, hormonal injection, then, um, for example, what do you do about it? Do you continue the production? Um, do, you, do you tolerate, would citizens, would clients, tolerate that kind of uh, deviation from the promise versus the uh, pharma uh, industry and the health sector. What The level of tolerance per sector, what, what do you have, uh, um, Ayman, to share with us on, on this topic? Okay, so, so there are different things. Um, usually when, when, when people put a code of ethics for a company, it's an internal thing. So it's part of our internal behavior that we do day to day to do the right thing. Um, And most of the time it's not exposed to the outside world 
except maybe through recruitment where people talk about it uh, or in other incidents or when the system actually falls. Uh, and there are examples of that. But most of the time, code of ethics are internal to the company. Once I start introducing it through my product, so the product itself has a message that includes part of that code of ethics, then now it becomes a product strategy. And now it becomes a product feature. And now as a product feature, uh, if I am claiming that my product is green or is fair trade or whatever, then there has to be certain standards and the, there has to be um, compliance with that standards. And in some parts, actually, uh, sometimes you may get into regulations for regulating that standards. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a more complicated issue because sometimes they're also industry-wide standards, not just individual. So when you get into things related to, um, for example, fair trade or green products or uh, uh, products that are free from uh, uh, antibiotics, hormones, and all of that in agricultural products. So then it, it, the claim itself might justify premium pricing. So the consumers have the right to ensure that the claim is met. Then you get into industry standards, uh, specs, uh, monitoring for the specs, and in many cases, regulations around that. So those are two separate stories, but both of them are real and both are there. If you're going the consumer product side, then you have to be very clear that this is a product feature. It is not something that you can, a label you can put uh, without actually understanding the consequences of it. And if you're using it as a competitive advantage, then that also has implications and um, your, cons your competitors would like to get into that space. So there is a space for collaborating with your competitors and setting industry standards. Uh, this is why sometimes you have industry associations and sometimes the government actually jumps in if it becomes a, a wide uh, a wide issue. So that's a, that's a very, and that's a big area. And that's a yeah. very important area. You'd find this in agriculture sector mm -hmm. with standards. You would find it in labor practices in manufacturing. Uh, you would find it in uh, areas like Islamic finance. It's a certain code of ethics that justifies a product. Uh, you would find it in um, areas related to um, what else? Uh, all the clean, green, bio types of products mm -hmm. and so on. So yeah. the, the, these are product issues. And, and, and there are huge business opportunities in those sectors, especially with the upcoming new generations. Uh, and I think it's worth thinking about. But again, it's different from your personal or institutional code of ethic, which is a very different side of mm -hmm. the equation. Definitely. Um, we do notice um, a new trend in impact investments, um, green funds, um, impact acceleration, and a global movement towards uh, that. Um, what are the top trends that you've seen? Um, what is the kind of uh, uh, points that, that an entrepreneur needs to keep an eye on um, while seeking? Uh, growth opportunities and investments and, and um, um, debt financing uh, um, um, needs for, for the growth of their company. Okay, What's so impact, impact investment is a very interesting area and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you bring it up because it's, uh, it's an area where a lot of people talk about, but it's actually also one of those big areas that have not been completely defined yet. So what's the story of impact investing? Investing in general is I am putting my money uh, in investing in a company or uh, an institution in general, and I have expectations of risk and return. And that's pretty much it. So I am expecting 10% return and a certain level of risk. Um, if another option, let's say venture capital gives me higher risk, I expect higher returns. Government bonds, much lower risk, much lower returns. It's always been like that. It's very simple. It's all about money, risk adjusted return on investment. Pure and simple, done. Now you get different people who start saying, but I don't want to be investing in everything because I want my money to go to areas that I care about. And you started getting that topic starting from people saying, I don't, I don't want to get into certain products. Um, started to have funds that say, we don't invest in sin industry. I'm not going to invest in uh, alcohol, tobacco, gambling, or weapons. Yeah. That was a beginning of it. And then some people said, okay, we want to 
move a little bit a notch higher. You started getting people saying, I want to invest in green products, but that became very ambiguous. So people started putting standards and saying, let's, let's get it to an area. They called it ESG, environmental, social, and governance. I want to invest in companies that meet certain standards for environmental, social, and governance. Mm -hmm. And that actually now has become very codified. So very clear standards for ESG. And there are new funds that are saying, I am going to invest in companies that meet those standards, period. And I'm not going to put my money anywhere else. And that actually created a very interesting space that's incentivizing people to get into companies that are ESG compliant. But it becomes another compliance issue, not a code of ethic. Now it's becoming part of my business and a preference. Yeah. Okay. And then you have other people, let's say, who want to invest in Islamic finance. I want my money to go to companies with a certain set of values that I care about. So all of these are examples across the spectrum. Some are regional, like Islamic finance. Yeah. Some are Western, uh, like ESG or uh, getting out of sin industries. Uh, and these are personal preferences. But now impact, this is, this is kind of the first wave. Impact is very different. Impact is saying, I want to put my money to invest in certain spaces and I want those businesses to generate an additional social impact on top of my financial return. Like what? I I'll tell you, and some people are saying, uh, I expect the same financial return, but I want a bit more social in, um, uh, social uh, value or impact. And others are saying, no, 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 I'm actually willing to get accept a little bit less on the financial return in exchange for a little bit higher on a social impact because I want to get money, but feel good. Okay. Okay, so that becomes a, a, a very kind of a interesting space because it depends on how you define it. So you get some uh, people starting from the micro all the way to the mega. And I'll give you examples on both. Okay. So some mega private equity funds say that we are launching a, a fund for financial inclusion to invest in Africa or in emerging markets. Okay. And we will invest in companies that provide in fintech startups or companies that provide more uh, more access to financial services and products under that's the whole financial inclusion part to yeah. people especially uh, marginalized communities across the world yeah. we're going to make a ton of money because fintech is growing and huge but we also think that financial inclusion is great and then you get companies doing mobile wallets mobile payments nano lending uh, alternative credit scoring all of that space very interesting space you get other people who are saying we want to invest in healthcare. So you get mega healthcare companies that are looking for also tech platforms that are providing remote health, uh, different ways of uh, reaching uh, people in remote areas and so on. Um, huge business opportunity, good social impact. So those are examples all the way from the big ones. You move down all the way to the micro. Micro is more about, I want community initiatives. So I'm looking for small individual community initiatives that are investing, making micro finance investments with, uh, for someone to improve their farm, get a, uh, raise a cow, uh, get some chicken, uh, do some low scale cultiv uh, small size uh, farm or agriculture or, uh, or uh, manufacturing activities. So all of these things are impact because it because is money then, social but the, so so that's why the world is the space is very very, uh, very diverse and it's very challenging to define what the social impact is but it will also be costly right so so doing the right thing can take longer can needs more time to re research to to put some uh, resources towards towards that how do you justify it as an entrepreneur as as an aspiring um, individual that wants to do good, but also is faced by scarce uh, resources. How can I justify doing good? So there is a spectrum of, of, of actions. So let's take it all the way from one end to the other. There's one end. My objective is financial return. Yeah. Okay. So I want to make money and I will abide by the law, period. I don't care about anything else. That's the traditional view of a business. Okay? And that's a majority used to be a majority now it's actually there are many other alternative ones but that's the traditional thing i will do i will make a lot of money and i just my commitment is to abide by the law some people will start saying well no i am a socially responsible business so i will go to make a lot of money but i have not just the law i have my code of ethics environmental social governance labor 
So I'm not willing to, uh, uh, to sacrifice a certain set of values for the financial. So I might make a tiny less amount of money than the other guy who doesn't care as much, but I am going to stick to that so, uh, uh, sort of set of values. And we're getting more and more businesses to become socially responsible businesses. Mm. Okay. And this is not about CSR. This is not about just putting a couple of million dollars in a foundation on the side. This is about a code of ethics and behavior inside the organization that guide decisions related to social, environmental, labor issues and guide those trade-offs that would accept paying a little bit more to justify, to, to actually take care of those values and principles, but we are still a for-profit company. Okay. Okay. And then you start moving a little bit to what people call a social business or a social enterprise. And that's when we start getting into an interesting area where you people would have a dual uh, mission. So I have a mission of both making a financial profit and actually educating people. So maybe I'm starting a chain of schools or an online website, uh, an online educational website. Uh, and we've seen several people, uh, uh, Nafham or Khan Academy or any of those organizations, they are social enterprises. They're, they're, they're financially driven, but they also have a mission. So whenever I'm making decision, I have this, now it's getting conflicting. I have a dual, uh, a dual criteria for making decisions. Mm. Uh, and sometimes we face conflicts. And that, that, that's the point where you have two values competing. Uh, yeah. but, but, you do that. Yes, but, but that's when you get the leadership and people saying, I'm going to have to make a decision at some point. Uh, that's when you get the social enterprise. And then you get completely the social sector, which is people who are purely driven by social dimension uh, and not thinking about the profit side. But the social enterprise business is a very interesting and evolving space. And it has a lot to do with impact investment because the investor and the social enterprise, they fit yeah. together. Uh, the word social enterprise has been misused in many contexts because you've seen, you see people from uh, a lot of people thinking about it as a non-for-profit, which is not the case. Uh, it's actually in the US and in the UK, there are regulations that regulate social enterprises that are for-profit, but at the same time uh, with an additional value system attached to it. So that, that's an interesting space. Do we have any similar regulations in our uh, part of the world? No, we have many social enterprises. We have organizations yep. that support them. Things like Ashoka for the Arab world, uh, Nahdat Mahrusa in Egypt. There are some organizations that support social enterprises, but we do not have a regulatory framework for them. Should we? Should we have? Um, honestly, it's a, it's, it's a bit challenging. My, my initial, and I've worked in that space for a long time. My initial gut is we need to open the space more for the civil society, because within the structure of the civil society, you might be able to do a lot of the work that goes in there and also open the space more in the for-profit companies yeah. um, before getting into new regulation. I'm not a big fan of introducing new laws before yeah. actually making use of the ones that you have. We have uh, frameworks for operating that are not, uh, we have in Egypt, we have a non-profit company in the law, but it's not activated. Mm. Historical reasons beyond the beyond the context of this conversation, but we have a, a nonprofit company already in the law. Yeah. So there are some things that can be very easily activated that would give you the space to do what you want. Oh, do you feel um, there is a responsibility, uh, a shared responsibility, perhaps among uh, um, citizens, among, uh, among uh, universities or, or schools, to to build that awareness? Do you feel there is enough awareness about social? Uh, social responsibility about ethics in, in, in uh, entrepreneurship? So uh, there is a huge responsibility for us to have it as part of the narrative. Um, I'm not a big fan of uh, ethics is part of the day-to-day -day choices that we make. So I'm not a big fan of having a dedicated course in ethics. Mm -hmm. In our university, we have a course on ethics. Yeah. Uh, I am more of a fan I of making usually sure skip, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, I want to study a topic on ethics and a conversation and a case study in every single course because it's part of finance, it's part of marketing, it's part exactly. of operations, it's part of technology. Uh, so it needs to be part of the discussion, the conversation. That's a lot more important than just having the title in a course, which is uh, 
I, I don't think it's the best approach. It's not a standalone thing. As you mentioned, we, we face choices every day of our lives uh, from simple decisions and simple conflict um, up to uh, decisions that, that have to hire, fire, use, reuse a specific thing. Um, and, and we need to have this strong foundation among ourselves to start with as individuals and then um, live by them and reflect them in our, um, in our organizations, whatever they may be. Um, I do agree with you that it's definitely a shared responsibility and something that a conversation that needs to continue. Um, and this is part of the, the webinars uh, that, that MIT are hosting. MIT EF, um, um, it's, it's, we are acknowledging uh, the, 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 the need for open dialogue uh, for such topics. Uh, we need to talk about them more. We need to address the situation. We need to uncover a few uh, um, uh, hidden topics that, that we, as you mentioned in the beginning, we take them for granted or we assume the answer to be in a specific um, um, way. Um, before opening up the session to uh, the room for, for uh, uh, questions and answers, there is one last point that I want to um, uh, speak to you, Ayman, about and, and, and hear what you have to say about it. Um, I personally um, wonder what the future will look like with all the amount of data that is being collected uh. by different platforms, uh, applications that we use, uh, the intentional and unintentional information we supply to those platforms. Um, what are your thoughts around artificial intelligence and the ethical element in AI? Uh, that's a tough one and that's a big, that's a big issue. So let me start with a big, th the beginning of the problem. Um, and that has to do with, th there's data part and there's AI part and they're very close, but th th there's some differences. Um, a lot of people who make decisions on the technical side are the techies, software developers, software engineers. And these decisions are literally embedded in the code. Yeah. Okay. So somewhere in the machine, in the code, in the program, in the website, there is an algorithm that says, if X, then Y. Yeah. That statement of if X, then Y, embedded in it, there's some moral judgment value that is embedded. And most people are unconscious about it. And uh, it ends up that it affects people's lives because who are dealing with these applications? They're people like us. So it's very important then actually, that actually people start thinking about the ethical and moral parts of whatever technology we're making. Technology is not value free. It's not free of values. It is usually built around some implicit values mm -hmm. or decisions that people make. Sometimes it's for efficiency. We just were not conscious of it. Sometimes it's because that's what I think is the right thing. And I might be... Uh, a 21 year old software developer in Bangalore in India. And I'm making a judgment about how credit is extended in Egypt. Okay, and I have, I have no clue where Egypt is on the map, but I am making a decision that is embedded in a software uh, for a nano or micro lending in uh, software yeah. that is going to operate in Egypt. And someone who's sitting for Domyat or Shar'iya, who is going to apply that value that I'm bringing from my small town or village in India is actually going to apply on them. And I have not thought about it. Okay, so that's, that's a very interesting part. So what happens with AI is that you're trying to use large data sets to train the machine to make some decisions in a very quick way based on data that we have accumulated from human behaviors over a large duration of time. Okay, so that, that's literally what's happening right now. It's not about any of the cyborg uh, sci-fi movies that's happening. It's more about literally taking a, a data set of behaviors of people, for example, in the credit part. Mm. Uh, I am collecting data set about a large number of people and I'm trying to make inferences that people who look like this usually pay their loans and people who look like this usually default. 
and I don't care about anything other than I look at those variables and I just try to do that. So when someone comes who looks like this, I give them money. When someone comes who looks like that, I don't give them money. Yeah. Now, what's the data set based on? Whatever data set that I get. So mm -hmm. i give you some examples and we talk about it. But let's assume I use a data set from India mm -hmm. to train my algorithm. And actually, there is an example of a Pakistani company that's launching yeah. in Egypt. So I use a data set from Pakistan uh, to extend in Egypt. It is trained, the computer, the artificial intelligence is tra trained based on the behavior of Pakistani people. Yeah. Now I'm launching it in Egypt. Well, are Egyptians and Pakistanis similar? In many ways they are, but in some ways they aren't. They aren't. I don't know, honestly, I don't know in what areas they are and they aren't. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to apply that logic on Egyptians. And suddenly I'm going to find very weird behaviors that people from certain place or type or demographic or whatever are not being granted credit while others are. So what does that say? There is an implicit bias that is embedded in that AI logic. Okay, where did that, did that come from? From the data set that I used to train. Okay, what can I do about it? Well, I need to start thinking about how are Egyptians different from Pakistanis and try to have data from Egypt. Well, if I don't have this data, so what do I do? I just launch and I will just proceed. Yeah. So that's the challenge. Uh, we have now um, uh, facial recognition software that is used to identify that this image on the screen is Pakiza and this is Ayman. And in some cases, it's actually taken for security or legal. Uh, it may have security or legal implications. Well, a lot of these facial recognition algorithms, they work well for Caucasians, white mm -hmm. people, because they were trained based on data sets of Caucasians. They work with a lot lower accuracy for people who are black and much lower accuracy for people who are Asians, yellow. Okay. Why? Because they have not used facial data to train the algorithm. Maybe the algorithm that's done in China works better for Chinese people and not as not much for the others. So what's happening is there is a certain bias embedded in my the AI, and it has real life implications on real people. So yeah. we need to be very conscious about what data do we feed to the AI to make what kind of logic and what are the implications of that logic. Uh, usually there are uh, regulations for how banks or financial institutions extend their credit. Okay. But how do those regulations, and, and those regulations are designed for equality, uh, making sure there is no discrimination. It's not that I discriminate against women or against people who are from certain place or background or religion or ethnicity or whatever. But now when this is embedded very deep in the law, in the AI, how do I make sure that these regulations flow? That's not easy for the tech company and for the regulators, for the regulators to monitor and for the tech company to comply with. So those are, those are real ethical issues that are out there. Um, now you mentioned data. I actually we'll go ahead and then we'll talk about data because there are issues of no, cost. The question of cost as well keeps on coming up. It's the regulation. It's it's what kind of information and how how to train those data sets. It will cost money. Yeah. It will take time to perfect it. So how do I do that balance and how do I do this trade-off decision? So, so that's, a, that's an amazing question. And that's about the, con the, the challenge that we're facing right now. If I start over-regulating from the beginning, mm -hmm. I am slowing the progress of technology. Okay. But if I ignore the regulation, then I am basically disadvantaging people. It will happen. I don't know which people will be disadvantaged. It might be you, it might be me, it might be someone else. But most probably, it will be the poorest, the least advantaged people. That's what happens. Privileged people usually don't get that discrimination, yeah. have access. So it usually trickles down. So the question is, how do I actually start at the beginning when things are below scale, small size, to let people experiment and observe what's happening? Once they become big enough, I have to start looking at it with a very different regulatory eye. Big example, uh, social media, Facebook. Facebook yeah. is a platform where you and I would connect and uh, maybe uh, send a picture of a holiday or a chat or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now it's the biggest political platform, advertising platform, business platform, shopping platform, communications platform, data collection platform, uh, even creating revolutions platform. Okay, so now I cannot deal with it as this is the kind of um, naive platform where two friends can chit chat. No, 
So the regulatory governance for that must look very different. Okay. okay. So when it's small, when the impact is little, when the scope is limited, let it play. Once it starts growing, the challenge is it, is it grows so fast, by the time it grows, everything is embedded enough and it's very hard, yeah. hard to change. So Twitter is struggling right now. How do they actually maintain free speech and maintain their commercial business model and revenue schemes and not to anger politicians, which is crazy, and at the same time, make sure that there is, uh, they're not used for uh, misinformations or campaigns in a negative, in, in an unethical way. Yeah. And it is tough, and I don't blame them, actually. It's a big, they want to do the right thing, but it's very hard, and someone is going to attack them because they're gonna be taking positions. The only way to protect them is actually for them to work with the government to create regulations that would tell them these are the rules that you guys need to comply with so they are protected because the role of the government is representing the public good. Their role as a company, they cannot be responding to everything. They cannot be a political mediator. There are different people who are engaging on that platform with different political agendas and it's not the job to be a political mediator. Yeah. So the government needs to jump in even for their interests. It's not just to, it's not restricting them, but it's also protecting them. So, so that, that, that is the challenge. Um, same thing for AI, you let it play, but then at some point you'll have to jump in and say, when nano finance is affecting 50,000 people, that's fine. When it's affecting 50 million people, that's a different story. Uh, and I have to make sure that it's actually within certain governance rules. So the government, some governments are trying to do regulatory sandboxes, central yeah. banks are doing that, uh, places to experiment with the laws and others are trying to wait until it develops somewhere else and then you import the regulations. Uh, but it's, it's a big challenge. A big, uh, a big and a fast catch up that regulators have to yes. um, be aware of those latest technologies and, and, and regulators be are aware not of all these trends and the impact that, no. they, that they have and the implications they have on, on the uh, users, the communities and the effect it has. Very interesting. Um, I'm really interested with this conversation um, and I want to uh, uh, open up the floor for some questions from the audience. Um, um, let's see what we have uh, received so far. Um, we do have a question uh, from um, we have a question. Uh, what is your opinion on mitigating risk based on bias, such as racism, class, um, in the ethical domain? So, um, so that, that's a big challenge. And that, that, that's basically follow up on the whole AI that conversation that we're having. Now, uh, bias will be there. Um, and especially when we're creating something new. Because bias, especially if you're automating a process, okay, bias is usually embedded in the literally in the details of the process. That's where you start getting that bias. Uh, there are several ways to deal with it. One way is to try and design, to try and have those values implicit in the design of any platform whenever you're starting at the beginning. So if you say that I care about the following values, for example, my platform need to uh, not discriminate in the following way. So I want to test, part of my testing is make sure that my AI or logic or platform is not discriminating. And that becomes part of my system requirements. So it's explicitly mentioned and tested against and calibrated. So that's an important part. Another part is making sure that inside my organization, I have um, a, an, a group or whatever you want to call it, that is constantly make, watching those decisions and looking for any bias that emerges because we cannot predict everything and design everything in a perfect way. A formal group, Ayman, an yeah, identified group. group, this is their yes. role to do. Yes. Okay. yes, of course, it depends on the size of the organization. Yeah. Uh, if I'm small, it might be another role for a person, but if I'm big, I need to have a watchdog inside my organization that looks and says, especially if I'm, let's say I'm a big, I started as a small nano lending company, but now I'm big, I'm lending to millions of people. I need to have a watchdog inside the organization that's literally reviewing my numbers and my profile and starting to look for any systemic bias mm -hmm. and trying to figure out where is it coming from and what do I need to do about it? If I'm not conscious about this, I'm going to actually, then I'm not serious about it. 
is, is very similar to the diversity part. We all yeah. want to have diverse organizations, but we make individual hiring decisions. But is there someone looking at the big picture and looking at the macro statistics? What is the percentage of whatever category is your favorite inside my organization? So everybody cares about women empowerment, but I have 1% of my employees who are women. Yeah. Okay, so what does that say? Every single person is hiring based on their individual decision, but they're hiring a man. Mm. Okay. So what do I need to do about it as an organization? Do I uh, look at my procurement, uh, sorry, on my recruitment policy? Do I look at the pipeline of people who walk into that? Do I look at certain quota? Do I look, what is there? Do I look at specific issues in my work culture that is actually not attracting women to work in this organization? So I have to figure out what's the problem. It's the underlying. So first is the individual decision might be right, but the macro picture looks wrong. So unless someone is looking at that macro picture, you're mm -hmm. not going to figure out the problem. Yeah. So someone needs to look at, at that macro picture, figure out what the problem is, the symptom, which is lack of diversity, lack of inclusion, lack of whatever, and try to figure out what is the reason that I ended up in that situation and try to fix that reason. Yeah. Some yeah. companies do it in artificial ways. I'm going to enforce a certain quota for X, for Y. Yeah. Not the best way. Might be needed at some point, but not the best way. But I need to look at the root cause. And usually with this role or with, with, with those group of people um, report directly to the CEO, for example, or is it best for them to be under HR or, or like what is the, the norm uh, uh, that you've noticed? Uh, Definitely not HR. Uh, mm -hmm. If those people are looking at the product, then it's a product issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's good that whoever is looking at the macro picture has a little bit more independence and higher level of access because you are going to be challenging someone at some part of the organization and tell them you have to change something and that person might have a budget to actually uh, target to reach or some uh, and, yeah. and it's not in their day-to-day -day priority list so someone needs to make it a priority so usually those things that are about shifting the organization culture and processes from one direction to the other need to be attached to the top of the organization, somewhere in the top of the organization. Nice. Lovely. Thank you. Um, we do have a question from uh, Abida Diab. Uh, what is the difference between non-for-profit organizations uh, or companies and social enterprises? Okay. So let's take the spectrum into three things. There is uh, what is the motivation of these, this entity? Some entities are not for profit. Some entities are for profit. Yeah. For profit is traditionally what we call company, where profit is the primary objective of the business. Non-profit is usually, some people call them NGO or NPO, non-governmental organization, non-profit organization. Mm -hmm. They're usually an entity that is driven by a social mission. Mm -hmm. And by that, it does not, it might receive money, whether donations, grants, or even investments, but it does not distribute profits to people who are running it or who own it. Okay? So that's, those are two very clear things. Now you get into the social business or the social enterprise. Uh, the point there is that I have a dual mission. I want to generate money and I also care about the social mission. So legally, I've seen three different ways to organize the social enterprise. In some countries, people do them as a business. Mm. So I can give profit. So I might create a social enterprise. I get into that space. I make money. I get profit. But the social dimension is very big in my decision making. And that's doable and it exists. Some people do them as non-profit. So I will make profit, but it gets recycled inside the entity. So I'm not distributing the profits to Pakiza or Ayman. No, it gets recycled inside. So I generate revenues, market revenues from selling a product or service, and I make money. It might be subsidized by some grants or not. Okay. Okay? But still, I make money. I make market revenues. But I do not distribute the dividends or profits. I recycle them inside the organization for my social purpose. Okay, there is a third part, which is some companies uh, like B Corps in the US or in the UK, they also have a special law for that, where they're trying to create what they call hybrid organizations that have some legal features of the for-profit and non-profit companies, depending on the uh, model that they've done. They were very, uh, people were interested to see that legal model about 10 years ago, but for yeah. some reason it has not been widely adopted even when it's introduced in the UK and the US. So. Uh, I don't, this is why I was saying I'm not too excited about a new law, 
but I think there needs to be more flexibility in the company's law to mm -hmm. allow people to add emission uh, and on the nonprofit law to allow more revenue, uh, market-based revenues to come in consistent with the nonprofit yeah. nature of the organization. Yeah. Okay, That's so just to summarize, uh, for-profit, non-profit is a legal status and a legal regime. Social enterprise, it's a preference on how you want to structure your organization, whether this way or that way. Nice. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, Ayman Shihata is oh. asking about um, your thoughts on promoting impact investment in Egypt. Yes. Hello, Ayman. Always asking a tough question. So... <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so what's the difference between impact investing in health and education and regular investing in ho hospitals and schools? And that's a very, very tough question because every company in a way has a positive social impact. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we're talking about social enterprises and investing in healthcare as impact investing, but um, the best impact on healthcare has been happening by pharmaceutical companies. Okay. People hate pharmaceutical companies because they're jacking up prices and all of that. But the impact of a pill can save millions and billions of lives and of actually uh, healthcare uh, costs. Mm -hmm. So someone, for example, may spend weeks in a hospital and now this pill actually would solve their disease. And the company is charging $100 for the pill. So people are saying the company is crazy to charge $100 for the pill. It costs them five cents to produce. But the company will tell you the alternative to the pill is spending $5,000 in a hospital. We're saving people $4,900, and this is just a small fraction. Yeah. So it's a, it's, it's a crazy conversation. But there is a great positive social impact coming out of pharma companies, even if people criticize them, and I do, and hate them sometimes. But the I mean, look at if someone invents a cure for the COVID-19 and they sell it for $1,000 a pill. I would go and get it, right? And governments would pay for it. And we still, we would go and attack the pharma companies for selling it for such an exuberant price and making a lot of money out of people's health. But we would also be so happy to save the trillions of dollars and all the closures of the economy and all of that. So back to Ayman's question. So what's the difference? I think the difference is how do you think about the business? So if my objective of the business is uh, pure for profit, then that's a for profit. And I'll give you an example. If I am in a pharmaceutical company, pharmaceutical company would prioritize the research on diseases that have a larger number of infections so that the market is bigger. Mm -hmm. okay. Is that a fair prioritization of resources? Yes, it is. If I have X amount of money, would I invest it to cure a disease that's attacking a million people or a disease that's attacking five people? Okay. Now, would I prioritize it to, attack, to solve a disease that's attacking people in rich countries versus a disease that's attacking people in poor countries? That's you know, what happens, okay? So that, so, but my decision-making is capacity or, or direction is based on for-profit, market size, product, potential, pricing. Mm -hmm. That does not make it a social enterprise. It makes it a good company and has good social impact because they do, but it does not make it social enterprise. Social enterprise, I might go and say, you know what, I'm going to do actually a research on this disease that is affecting people in India and Africa, even though it's going to make less money for me. I'll still make some money, mm -hmm. but it's going to make less money for me. So it's yeah. all about your decision, at least in my mind, the differentiator is a very subjective way of decision making that takes that other criteria of the social dimension in a better way, in a different way. So I can build schools that are for profit, but am I targeting a disadvantaged community and making a little bit less money, but I'm expanding the educational benefit. So it is a decision making part and it's about the trade offs between profit and mission and how much does mission play in that. If mission comes high, I am a social enterprise. If mission comes low, I am a traditional for profit business and this fine, both are fine but I need to figure out what I am and communicate what I am in an honest way. Yeah. Nice. Um, I think we have one last question before we uh, wrap up uh, the session. It's from Antonios. Uh, what can governments do to improve or encourage ethics in business? Do governments have a role in this, uh, Ayman? Uh, absolutely, they do. Um, and I think it's, it's a big conversation between uh, or the difference between law and 
and ethics. Um, and you mentioned at the beginning, you had a very uh, interesting quote, the right to do things, doing things that I have the right to do versus doing things that are right to do. Things that I have to, the right to do are things that are legal. Mm -hmm. Okay, And the law does not and should not regulate every single aspect of our lives. Right? So um, the law cannot tell me to be nice to people. Okay, But the law can tell me that I cannot walk in the street and hit people in their face. So we as a society find that there's a certain boundary that we need where things are becoming really, really important that we need to regulate. Regulate means enforce and police and court and fines and all of that. And things that are not nice, not good, but we don't want to regulate because it's just, it's too cumbersome. I don't want the, gov I don't want the government to regulate every single aspect in my life. And I'm willing to tolerate some bad things because too much regulation is bad. Okay, so it's a trade-off between what do I want to regulate and what do I not want to regulate. So when we talk about, for example, uh, a value like transparency, mm. there are some elements of transparency that the government or the stock market or the company's law would force you to do. If you're a public company, you have to produce information about one, two, three, right? Uh, but there are some additional transparency measures that me as a company may want to do voluntarily. So that's not regulated. So, the, and that's good. So the question for the government is, what is the part that you want to regulate? Because you think it is really critical and important. And without it, there is a significant damage to the whole society system. And that's a trade-off. Uh, in Egypt, and probably in the whole region, we tend to over-regulate. Every mm -hmm. time people find a problem, they want a law for it. You cannot have a law for every problem. You cannot have a law for everything because then what happens is the law is diluted and the government doesn't have capacity to enforce 500 laws, so they're enforced in a random ad hoc way. Mm. So I'd rather have five laws that are really enforced yeah. than 50 laws that are not all enforced because I lose a sense of priority. So what parts of ethics should the government regulate? The parts that have to do with large risk for the system, for the society at large. When I find that lack of transparency may bring down the stock market, then I put standards for transparency. Okay. When I find that people cannot buy and sell without having the contract being enforceable, then I enforce the contract. Before that, people used to buy and sell in, a, in a, uh, an ad hoc way. We yeah. agree, shake hands, and we do that. But then it doesn't work. Uh, Zaman, the New York Stock Exchange, there was the verbal contract was uh, actually the, the way people did business. So if I tell you I'll buy that share for one dollar, that's a contract, legally enforceable contract. Nice. Okay. So so that's the role of the uh, the government. Yeah. So if we get into AI, the mm -hmm. government needs to start thinking about standards for making sure that AI is not biased but without stifling the innovation in that space that has not really opened up and matured. Maybe sometimes you say, you know what, wait until it gets a little bit bigger. Yeah. Okay. Maybe if a company is working with up to 100,000 people, I do not require regulation. Once they hit the 100,000, they need to start working on regulation and they cannot operate more than 200,000 without having a regulation in place. So size-based, risk-based. Yeah. Okay, so that, that, that's a reasonable way of thinking about regulation. Um, role of government has been dismissed for a long time. A lot of people would say the government needs to get out of the economy, just get out. And there are other people who are saying, I need a law for everything. Both approaches don't work. A law for everything, it means the government does not have capacity to enforce and there's a law for nothing. Yeah. Or get out of the way, there will be systemic risk and we're finding it right now failure in healthcare systems in some countries, in educational system, in regulating the internet, regulating privacy, all of that. And then even the, even the companies do not, are not able to operate. Yeah. So companies need to have a clear uh, set of standards to operate. But keep in mind, last point is regulation and innovation are usually conflicting uh, because innovation is about trying new things and regulation is about standardizing and putting rules for doing things. Innovation happens before I am ready with the rules. So whenever you have an area that's over-regulated, innovation is stifled. I need to figure out, I need to leave a space for experimentation and take the risk with it. But when things start becoming big enough that they have impact on the whole society, systemic risk, then I need to start looking at them to regulate them. Uh, and that, that, that's a very important part. It's not just an ethical conversation, it's a broader regulatory conversation.
Definitely. And we go back to your earlier idea of having and, and the trend that we're seeing uh, among different uh, central banks and different countries with the um, open innovation and embracing open innovation and having the uh, regulatory sandboxes and in different sectors allows the regulator to have a close look at a small sample with a small sort of uh, where the impact is, is manageable to an extent um, uh, so that when the time is right and the numbers extend, expand enough to have a proper sort of regulation, the regulators already included in this uh, journey is aware of the implications and can take the right decisions moving forward. Um, I believe this brings us to uh, uh, the end of our, our session, uh, Eamon, and, and the end is actually the conclusion of our session is to always have those open conversations. This is a huge topic. This is a heavy topic that impacts us individually, impacts us at different organizations, whether we are founders of startups, whether we are investors, whether we're, we work at the government, um, um, or, or are part of the educational system. Um, it is an ongoing conversation. It is ever changing. The, the trends and the implications uh, affect us all. So yeah. uh, be aware of, of what's going on. Uh, be aware of, of uh, your individual choices and um, um, keep on the conversation rolling. And definitely tune in to the next webinar with uh, MIT, the next uh, boardroom uh, webinar. And um, I can't wait to the next session. Yeah, thank, thank you so you much, Ayman. Thank you, Pakiz. And let me leave everybody with a couple of thoughts uh, just to keep in mind. Uh, first thing, as entrepreneurs, um, the company values and code of ethics is literally um, shaped around your personal values and code of ethics as an entrepreneur. Uh, and you need to be very conscious of it and be very careful about uh, what you embed in the company. You need to have that explicit discussion as the company grows. You need to be, to be careful at what gets codified in the policies, procedures, and the culture of the company. Second thing is technology is creating a lot of dilemmas uh, that are shaping and we're all thinking about. So whenever you're writing code, think about the values that get embedded in that code and the implications on people's lives. Um, and third thing is that there is no product or service that goes into the market that is values free. So they are also embedded in the products and we need to be careful about what we're doing. It might be in some time a business opportunity and sometimes it might be something that we want to live with. So um, keep that part of your conversation, your narrative and in the back of your mind, sometimes bring it to the front of your mind when it's needed. Thank you so much, Pakiza, and uh, very yeah. really, really pleased to be part of this conversation. And thank you, uh, MIT Enterprise Forum for, for having uh, having this at the as part of the narrative that's going thank you so much <laughs>